All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the endocrine system, which is chapter 11 in our textbook. And there's quite a few key terms here, and that's what we're going to be looking at is all these different <coughs> pathologies that affect the skeletal system, but that originate in um, this glandular system, a metabolic system. So here's the learning objectives I've identified. We want to look at the anatomy and physiology of the endocrine system, and I've said I'm going to emphasize the anatomy and kind of de-emphasize the physiology, even though the anatomy is relatively small and the physiology is the main consideration here. For us as x-ray techs, I don't think that we need to get into all the weeds of all these different hormones, um, but we do need to know what impact um, disorders or pathology of the endocrine system glands uh, cause in terms of skeletal function. Um, we'll talk about imaging considerations and for the most part we are not the front line. Um, there's going to be other things like nuclear medicine studies or MRI that's going to be the best. And But we will be able to see kind of the, um, the sequela, if you will, or the constellation of some of these disorders will start to have impacts on the skeletal system. Um, so like we'll look at how Paget's disease starts to affect the skeletal system um, or how osteopenia um, requires certain detective methods like a DEXA scan. So here's a list of the pathology I'm interested in. And I've already mentioned uh, I've got a, a typo on diabetes uh, mellitus. It's not in the name of what looks like maybe a Mexican restaurant. It's It's actually a spelled differently. Sorry for the dictation error. All right. Anatomy and physiology of this system. So the function of the endocrine system has to do with the secretion of hormones at, under stimulation from the neuro, neurological system. So it is closely tied to the functioning of the brain. Um, the one of the primary glands, kind of the controlling portion of the brain, is going to be the hypothalamus. It is kind of considered kind of the master, uh, the master of this entire system in terms of the neurological part of it. It communicates to the pituitary gland um, and to a lesser degree to the pineal gland. And it's, those glands then secrete hormones that are used as messengers throughout the body, and those hormones can trigger other, uh, other reactions. So, for example, sometimes those hormones are sent from the pituitary gland to stimulate other hormone uh, to be released by the adrenal glands. So it's a systemic response um, that originates in the brain and is communicated by a hormones, not neurons. So it's interesting. Um, the brain has then two ways to communicate with the body. It can communicate via neurons and it can communicate via hormones. Um, some of those hormonal processes impact the skeletal system, and that's what we're interested in in this class. Um, others of those hormonal processes impact the function of the kidneys and lead to things like diabetes. So that's the other thing that we're interested in in this class is how blood sugar and stuff like that works and what types of drugs um, might be used. The primary glands that we're interested in are the pituitary gland. Um, it has three lobes and it sits more or less um, in the cella tersica. So if we're looking at uh, lateral uh, skull film, we're looking, when we look at the cella tersica, we're looking at the place that the pituitary gland is situated. Um, changes in the pituitary gland um, can cause uh, developmental disorders. Um, it can cause people to, to grow very large. Um, so we'll be looking at that in, in just a moment. Um, and as well as uh, any kind of cancer that affects the pituitary gland can also affect uh, hormones. It is something like the master of all the other endo endocrine glands. So a lot of these hormones uh, originate at the pituitary gland. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary gland by what we call the pituitary stalk. Um, and so it is responsible for basically controlling the function of the pituitary gland. So that's an important thing to recognize, that the pituitary gland's function is not controlled by the pituitary gland. It's controlled by the brain. Um, so some of these uh, processes that we're going to look at um, 
have this neurological feedback system that's significant. So an example of that is like the stress response, something that we all experience to a lesser, greater or lesser degree almost every day, right? When the brain perceives threat of any kind in the environment around us, whether that's the threat of an exam or the threat of a car accident or whatever, um, the, it communicates to the pituitary gland to release um, hormones, right? Which then trigger the stress response system. Um, the, so those hormones then go to the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands release like adrenaline, which accelerates the heart rate, decreases, increases blood pressure, um, decreases appetite, decreases the sex drive. All of those things are designed to help us survive in an acute situation. Interestingly enough, it's meant to be an acute response. So the adrenal glands also release um, uh, cortical steroids, right, that um, are designed to turn the system off, right? So it releases, it creates the stress response, but it also creates enough of these other hormones to tell the system to stop, right? That hormone is meant to communicate with the brain with the hypothalamus. If for whatever reason it doesn't have receptors for that hormones, the stress response just continues. So an acute, an acute response becomes a chronic response, right? So that's what we're talking about when we talk about um, you know, being stressed out, right? Or so stressed that we can't think straight. There's some real uh, physiology behind that. Um, other uh, endocrine glands that we'll be looking at are the thyroid, parathyroid, and thymus. Um, thyroid and parathyroid are essentially located in the same place. In terms of imaging, especially with CT or MRI, we may be able to identify the thyroid. The parathyroid, to really identify it, it would require a nuclear medicine study. It's, it's a very um, small thing that's situated in the same space as the thyroid gland. Um, it would be difficult to see it in and of itself. Ditto with the thymus. Um, the thymus kind of is over close to the heart, and so it's really difficult to differentiate between the thymus and the musculature of the heart um, on MRI or on CT. There's a few other hormone producing organs that are going to be of interest to us, um, mainly for our purposes today is going to be the pancreas, but we should recognize that um, the gonads produce hormones that are responsible for um, a number of uh, things, everything from facial hair to the development of breasts, things like that, um, hypothalamus as well um, to a lesser degree. Um, and then it's important to look at the reasons why hormones are released. So while I don't necessarily think that we need to memorize what GNRH is or what MSH is, all these different hormones names, we do need to recognize why they are being released, right? So I've already uh, mentioned that they can be uh, neurological in origin, that a stress response, a perception of stress in the environment can cause the brain to initiate a stress response system based on interactions with the pituitary gland. Um, they can also be hormonal in nature. That's probably the predominant way that these systems interact, um, is that they're communicating hormonal signals to each other, right, that work in some ways very similar to neurological si uh, signals. They're communicating information, right, and that information is hormonal in nature. Right, um, So that's like what I mentioned, that when the adrenal gland releases uh, the adrenaline, it also releases other things that tell the brain to turn off the stress response system. That's a hormonal communication. Um, and then finally, humoral stimulations. Um, so these are, these are processes deep within the body that are more just kind of regulatory processes. Um, that as we're growing, for example, the bones say, you know what, we've grown enough. Um, we can turn off that system. In terms of the lay of the land, the areas that we're interested in, this chart on, uh, this is coming from page uh, 348 in our textbook. Um, these are helpful just to kind of have a general idea 
where's the uh, hypothalamus, pituitary, pineal gland, the thyroid, parathyroid, the thymus, the adrenal gland situated literally above the renals, that's what adrenal means, so above the kidneys, uh, the pancreas, and then uh, this person has both ovaries and testes. Um, so interesting. Uh, biological mutation. Um, I, I was told recently that the corpus callosum in females is, lar is larger than the corpus callosum in males, and that that's the way you can distinguish between a male and female brain, like on the autopsy or whatever. Um, so I had a colleague that was bragging to me that her corpus callosum was larger than mine. And I was like, fine, be that way. Um, but yeah, what we're ta the reason I want us to situate the corpus callosum is because that's something that's very ready to see on both CT and MRI. It's apparent when we're looking at on a sagittal view the corpus callosum. It's it's a it's a the difference, and just below it is where we're going to find like the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the adrenal glands, and just behind that is where we'll find the pineal gland. So being able to locate that corpus callosum is helpful because then I can kind of sort out where these other things are. They're they're a little bit more difficult to to detect. Um, Sometimes um, in psychology, because some of this is psychological in nature, we refer to two different brains. We refer to a reptile brain and a mammalian brain. Um, the reptile brain, and, and neurological develop, uh, developmental uh, neurologists talk about this sometimes too. The, the reptile brain is that area basically from the hypothalamus south. So things like um, the amygdala, which is responsible for that stress response system, um, hypothalamus, pituitary gland, all those things are part of this reptile brain. And the reptile brain is responsible for fight, flight, or freeze responses. So it's really, really good at keeping you alive, right? That's what the reptile brain is good at. Um, the mammalian brain is basically the prefrontal cortex, so everything that's kind of north of that, if you want to think about it as the upstairs of the house, the upstairs of the house is responsible for things like learning, language, logic, your relationships with other people in these complex ways that we learn based on relationships. So when we're born, what we have is the reptile brain fully functioning, fully online. Baby is ready to survive, right? What baby doesn't have until roughly the mid-20s fully developed is the mammalian brain, right? The upstairs portion of the house is still being built. So a lot of the ways that humans survive is based on relationships. We build relationships. We're relationship building animals. And so early on, you see that importance of a, a parent interacting with their child, responding when the child cries, making eye contact with the child. All of those things are teaching the brain based on the responses of the pituitary gland. Okay? So, um, the pituitary gland actually winds up controlling the size of the mammalian brain. This is really something to consider here. Because what I'm saying is the pituitary gland, if we're stressed, secretes hormones, right? Pineal gland as well is going to be secreting hormones. But if the dominant signal that we're receiving is a stress response signal, right? It kind of shuts down all these other systems. So what we have then online, fully online, is the reptile brain. The systems that get shut down are those systems that are responsible for building out the mammalian brain. So is that better or worse? Is one brain, is one brain better or worse? No. One of them's built more for survival and the other one's built more for relationship. Both of them are organs made to make sure that we're going to be successful in life. Um, the pineal gland is situated very close to it and is largely responsible for, for things like growth, right? So we're going to be seeing uh, if we, again, we, if we have that stress system responding, uh, initiating over and over and over again, the pineal gland um, will, its, its function is also going to be taken offline. One example of something that happens with the pineal gland as we age is that it reduces the secretion of melatonin. Now, melatonin is one of those things that sometimes people take as a sleep aid, right? So in addition to, uh, to negotiating how the body grows, the pineal gland is also responsible for what we call the circadian rhythm, right? 
um, how the body is told to be asleep or be awake, right? So generally the way that the pineal gland functions um, once we've reached adulthood is it does things like this. As it gets darker outside, it starts to release more melatonin and your body starts to feel sleepy, right? Um, it atrophies as we age and so older people have a harder time feeling like they're sleepy, right? Simply that, so they may need to take melatonin or a supplement um, in order to help themselves sleep better. We, it, the book mentions that and it's definitely in the news more often as a natural way to, you know, a sleep aid. All right, the adrenals. Um, like I've mentioned, it means above the renals. So there are these um, roughly pyramid-shaped organs that sit like little hats on top of the kidneys, right? And it's important for us um, in imaging, particularly for those of us who wind up in CT, to always scan through the adrenals. You've probably heard the text talk about that. Um, because it, it is an area where if there's a tumor or something, not only can it affect your body hormonally, it's very difficult to detect because it's not an area that's highly innervated. Um, so important to the adrenal glands is that they have a medulla and then they have a cortex. Um, the medulla is that center of it and the cortex is the area that surrounds it. They both secrete different stuff, right? I'll just leave it at that. Um, uh, but we see the cortex is primarily responsible for releasing those corticosteroids. So I do want to say something, a little bit of something about corticosteroids um, in, in your bodies and stuff like that, because this is helpful. Um, when you are stressed, right, and you're stressed for a long period of time, corticosteroids start to circulate through your bloodstream, right? And they are actually what we call neurotoxins, right? Um, they're not helpful to the development of your brain. So what I'm saying is long-term stress actually harms brain development, right? Long-term stress harms brain development. So um, what, do we, what, what do we do? How do we overcome that? Well, right, if you are someone who experiences stress a lot, and I, I'm a worrier, I experience stress a lot. I've had to learn meditation over the course of my life in order to turn that system off, right? Um, because since it is hormonal in origin, right? I can't just tell myself to calm down, right? I have to do something to calm down my heart rate, slow down my breathing in order to communicate, in addition to these corticosteroids, to my hypothalamus that you're safe, you're okay, you can calm down now, right? So I encourage y'all to consider that. Um, long-term exposure to corticosteroids so when we sleep at night it's the other part of this is sleeping when we're sleeping at night it allows for the neurons to kind of uh, expand they, they go into a more diffuse form of thinking and that's part of where dreams come from is that they they're less focused thought where they're closer they move apart a little bit and they the th thought process become more diffuse Similar to like if you're playing video games, that kind of thought process is more diffuse thinking, it's less focused. Um, that allows that opening of the gap, the synaptic cleft between neurons, allows the brain to flush out these corticosteroids, to flush out these neurotoxins, right? Um, and to basically hit the reset button, right? So the next day when we wake up, we can be more focused and we can be on task. Um, but again, the purpose of the corticosteroids is to tell the system to turn off, right? Um, that's, all, that's their primary design. Um, if they don't, if the system continues, the system doesn't listen to the hormonal signal, then that's when we start to get these long-term stress responses. The reason I'm focusing on some of that stuff versus some of the, the other things is when, when we get into the pathology, we'll be looking at some of the extreme examples, right? But these are examples of things that are in your own life that you experience probably every day. There's probably some of us who experience difficulty sleeping, probably some of us who experience some stress stuff. So I want you to be aware of how the system works in your own body so that we can better understand it when we look at what's happening in our patient's bodies. Okay, the thyroid gland, situated in the soft tissue of the neck, based just, just below the larynx, right, um, is, uh, and this is on page uh, 350 that I'm looking at, um, 
it has two lobes and they're divided by an isthmus, right? Which is just basically similar to, um, what's the other word? A peninsula. An isthmus is just kind of a, an area of kind of like where the land comes out. Um, the main thing that it's going to be some, uh, secreting is the thyroid hormone. It also is responsible for calcitonin. So when we look at things like osteoporosis, osteomalacia, we're going to be looking at problems that occur when we are not, when there's a dysregulation in calcitonin. Um, it also produces enzymes which are responsible for fighting things like infection, right? If in the case that we have an overactivity of the thyroid, what we're talking about is hyperthyroidism, right? And underactivity um, is hypothyroidism, underactivity. Um, so any, either one of these can cause severe metabolic disturbances in, the, in your body, right? Um, and we will look at some more of those here in just a moment. What's that? Nothing. Okay. All right. For the parathyroid, it, I mentioned that they're very difficult to see on any kind of imaging. And so pictures like this, I don't have a CT image to show you what the parathyroid looks like. It's just that little funny freckle on the thyroid, right? Um, para means like for or on the thyroid. Um, and it may be helpful to remember it as for the thyroid gland, that the parathyroid is a gland for the thyroid gland because there are four of them, right? They're kind of situated in different places on the thyroid gland. Um, and uh, this is responsible for uh, secreting a hormone that stimulates osteoclasts, right? So we've got osteoblasts and osteoclasts that are going to be the primary... Um, mechanism of changes in the skeletal anatomy that originate within the endocrine system. Um, so if we look at on page 350, he kind of uh, tracks that out. Um, in looking at calcitonin, it says it's the most, it's mostly important in childhood and it's an antagonist of the parathyroid hormones, hormones. So it serves to lower blood calcium levels by inhibiting osteoclast activity. Um, so osteoclasts are those things that are going to break down the bones, right? Um, and osteoblasts are those things that are going to build up the, the bones. So we have um, a complex of different glands, th the thyroid and the parathyroid, um, that are responsible for basically how much calcium circulating in the blood. Okay, change gears just a little bit. Let's talk quickly about the pancreas. Um, so within these, what, what we call uh, pancreatic uh, islets or the um, islets of Langerhans, um, we have alpha cells and beta cells. The important thing to remember about this, you can get lost in the weeds on the pancreas. Please don't, right? You can see this, this organ on CT and on MRI. It's apparent um, kind of mid-abdomen in the north part of the abdomen. Um, but what we're interested in this one is that it's responsible for the balance of insulin and glucagon in the bloodstream, right? If we have insufficient production of um, these hormones, then we have blood sugars that get off the chart. We, we're, we're eating appropriate amounts of calories or whatever, but the body's not processing it. And that's what we're talking about when we talk about diabetes. Now you might be thinking, well, blood sugar, that just makes you more sweet. And it does, right? It actually makes you smell like a cookie. But um, at the same time, it is absolutely playing hell on your kidneys, right? And other parts of your body. So that's why we need this to break down the insulin. Not only is it responsible for um, for cell of blood sugar, not only is breaking down the blood sugar important for cell life, it's also helping the kidneys. So hopefully that is a much more simple understanding than what the textbook gives us. I'm just trying to focus what is absolutely essential to us as x-ray techs. I know that there's a lot of material here. Um,
but I'm trying to uh, scale it down to something that's manageable for us. Um, so when it comes to imaging this stuff, we X-ray is not the best, right? We can see osteoporosis. We can maybe see osteopenia. We'll look at that in just a minute. Um, and we can look at endocrine disorders and Paget's disease, right? Uh, Cushing's and Paget's. But we're going to rely a lot on other parts of the um, imaging department in order to better see this stuff. But one thing that I think y'all are seeing some, and the textbook does mention and is helpful to understand, is DEXA scan, right? So bone mineral, mineral densitometry or double energy x-ray exotometry. Um, the dual energy part of this scanning procedure is one of the things that's most interesting because I do think in terms of development of just general radiography, I would guess that we're going to start to see more dual energy applications, right? Um, because it can be helpful for other things like the chest, um, dual energy. Um, so what we're using it for primarily in DEXA though is basically a whole body scan. Um, and uh, we're able to look at what the bone density is overall, right? And we can actually just release a score level, right? And we can score them uh, based on T-scores and Z-scores. So without knowing too much about all of this, you just need to know that you need a T-score higher than some number, and the Z-score kind of shows the range of what's healthy. Um, so who here has had an opportunity to operate a DEXA scanner? Okay, awesome. That's I've never operated one of these things, so y'all probably know more about how it works than I do. Um, but this is its main purpose is, again, to show us osteoporosis. The other thing it can be used for is bone metastases. So if we, if we suspect that the patient's got bone mets, they may order a DEXA scan. We can kind of see, is there areas where the bone has been worn away? Is this patient a candidate for palliative care? Those types of considerations can be done as well. Um, I saw an interesting thing on Facebook, on the Facebook group the other day about, it was a, a student who was concerned with being in the room during a DEXA scan, right? But like we looked at in radiation biology, the radiation level for a DEXA scan is below natural background radiation. So you're perfectly fine being in the room while a patient's getting a DEXA scan. You do not need to be concerned about the amount of radiation that's being used in that. And that's something to also tell your patients. We're using a very small amount of radiation. Even though we're scanning your whole body, we're using something less than natural background radiation. So take just the two seconds it takes to educate your patients on that. It will put them that much more at ease with the process. Looking at other imaging systems, MRI is probably gonna be our first line of defense with a lot of this stuff because of its, its sensitivity for soft tissue. Um, so all these uh, pituitary disorders, microadenomas, um, the progression of pituitary adenomas um, is going to be best evaluated on MRI. Um, like the textbook mentions, MRI is the only imaging modality that can reliably demonstrate pathology of the hypothalamus. Um, so uh, oftentimes we look at uh, the brain as well, looking at is the, does the cella turcica appear empty? That is a, is a finding that's there on MRI. We can also use things like gadolinium and contrast enhanced uh, MRI, MRI to look at uh, these adenomas. Of course, with MRI, you have the double bind, right? The gadolinium we're finding is not something we should use on every patient, right? Gadolinium can stick around in the body, and, it, and if, it, if the protective coating that's placed around the gadolinium wears off, you now have a heavy metal circulating in your body. So gadolinium is coated with something in order to protect the body. It's basically like injecting someone with lead, and you can imagine how serious that would be if we injected people with lead. So gadolinium has its drawbacks. Um, the other thing that we need to consider when we're doing MRI is if the patient has any metal in their body, things like that, um, that can create limitations to the study or possibly even cause a hazard to the patient. Computed tomography. CT is helpful. for So if we have a patient who um, we're concerned with whether or not MRI is going to be safe for them or if we don't think they can tolerate the MRI, 
um, CT may be a second line of defense. So it's not our first line of defense anymore. It's been demoted to a second line of defense. Um, but especially if we use contrast enhancement for CT imaging, we can see soft tissue structures pretty clearly on it. So we can look at things like pituitary disorders, the pineal gland, um, thyroid and parathyroid glands, and the adrenal ne neoplasms. Um, one thing I'll add with CT, and this is from maybe the CT class in the summer, anytime you're scanning through the patient's abdomen, right, um, it is helpful to look, make sure that the adrenals are included, like so for a general abdomen pelvis with contrast. Make sure the adrenals are included when you do the with contrast. And if you're going to do delays, go ahead and just include the adrenals on the delays. Because if there's ever a question about whether or not the patient has cancer of the adrenal glands, they can look at does the contrast drain out of the adrenals, yes or no. So it's a very easy way to make a, a, dis, to make a definitive diagnosis on if there is a kidney tumor or if there's adrenal tumors, um, sometimes called incidentalomas, is it cancerous or is it benign? If it's cancerous, it's going to have an affinity for the contrast. If it's not, it's going to let the contrast drain out of it. So we can look at that washout period of the contrast and make a determination. That way we can save the patient a trip for a biopsy, basically, which seems like a worthy cause to me. Nuclear medicine um, is going to be our go-to for anything with the thyroid because the thyroid is such a highly functional physiological organ and like I've mentioned it's a complex of organs really that are working in tandem with each other we are going to consider it primarily functionally and so um, the nice thing about nuclear medicine is not only can it be diagnostic it can also be therapeutic and so if there is um, a function that's causing hyperthyroidism we can use the thyroid's affinity for iodine we can make that a radioactive iodine, like iodine-123 or iodine-131, and allow that radioisotope to treat the thyroid. Um, let me see. Oh, the, uh, we can also use um, iodine-131 to treat uh, adrenal disorders. I will point out though on this slide, and we're thinking about, since we've talked a little bit about physiology there's, and, and therapy, if we've got a suspicion that something's going on with the pituitary gland, like we find one of those pituitary adenomas and the patient's uh, bone growth is dysregulated or their, their, their hormonal functions are dysregulated, oftentimes those pituitary type things have to be treated by radiation therapy. So they have what they call stereotactic radiation surgery. They basically screw a framework to the patient's skull, right? And they use that framework to line up to just the area of the pituitary. And they use a high-powered radiation beam to just treat this little tiny gland. And generally what they're trying to do is to shrink the gland down, right? Um, so uh, we also see uh, radiation therapy being called in to help with these. Okay, well let's uh, change gears again and talk a little bit about these uh, skeletal disorders. The first one that I'll talk about is osteopenia. Um, and we, this is any visible decrease in bone density, right? So uh, if it's not pathological or it's not causing any pain, a lot of times we'll call it osteopenia. We can actually relate this to um, a measurement of bone mass. So I'm not going to require you all to mem memorize these numbers, but as the bone mass drops to a certain level, we'll call it osteopenia. Um, if it drops further, it start, we start to call it osteoporosis. Um, there's two different uh, type ones. Uh, there's two general types, primary and secondary. Um, when we look at the primary forms of osteopenia, we can call them postmenopausal or senile. So um, postmenopausal just means that after menopause, we start to see a decrease in bone thickness, right? Um, and so this is something that tends to affect women more than men. So greater than 70% of women aged 60 years or older um, have some form of this bone marrow decrease, so osteopenia or osteoporosis. Um, 
And since osteoporosis is, is, is on this slide, I'll go ahead and mention um, anytime we've got osteoporosis, it means that we've fallen below a certain threshold of bone min mineral, mineral density, right? So osteopenia, it's just kind of in this range. Um, and then it, once it falls below that range, we've got osteoporosis, right? Um, and the structural integrity of the trabecula of the bone starts to be impaired. So at that point, we can look for trabecular patterns in the bone, and you'll see an erosion of trabecular patterns, right? So you can see it on an x-ray. You can at least see a, a loss of those trabecular patterns. That's that kind of spider web matrix inside of the bones. Um, when we talk about uh, senile uh, osteoporosis, um, this is just something tied to age, and so this is something that can affect uh, men as well. Um, and then secondary is anything that is a result of a disease process or another medication that they're taking. So if a person's taking certain medications that affect um, uh, bone calcium levels, then we'll call that uh, secondary uh, osteoporosis. Um, it can be uh, generalized or regional. Um, and I think, yeah, the last thing that I'll say about this is this, uh, if we see it um, regionally uh, tied to the spine, if, as the osteoporosis starts to affect the spine, we sometimes get what we call kyphosis or the dowager's hump. So it's that hump back of the spine, which makes for imaging difficulties when we're trying to do a PA chest x-ray. This person has a, a pronounced kyphotic spine. It can make things more difficult. I'm going to turn down the lights so we can look at this. This is uh, osteopenia. And I'll turn them back up in just a minute. So I have the disease process here. I have the normal one here. It's very, very subtle, right? So what I mentioned with osteoporosis is you would start to see an erosion of this trabecular pattern. You would not see that kind of calcium matrix that's there inside of the, the bone ends especially, right? Because it's, it's being eroded away. But when we look at these two x-rays, the diseased and the normal, the thing that stands out to me is that I can see nice crisp. When I'm looking at the outside margin of the bone, I see a high brightness right here because it is dense with calcium, right? Versus over here, it is just simply not as bright. It's grayer, right? So I'm looking at these really subtle things, like how bright is that right there versus that right there. The normal one is a little bit brighter, right? And those bony margins, right? So that's the calcium. That, uh, the reason I'm putting this up here is that initially the calcium that's being worn away is this calcium on the outside of the bone, right? Um, so we do see, a, look at this right here, where I can barely tell a difference here versus over here. Right? This is just denser as a whole versus that. It's grayer. So subtle, subtle finding. Uh, I'm going to turn the lights back on. Sorry. Okay. Continuing on with how we're going to diagnose this then. Like I mentioned, this is a very subtle finding. Once we get to uh, osteoporosis, though, generally there's going to be pain associated with it, right? Um, so ongoing back pain, pain in the hands, depending on the type of osteoporosis that's going on. Uh, a DEXA scan is going to be a very, very helpful way to see just how far it is. This is a subtractive pathology. It's eroding away at the bones. Um, and the treatments that are going to be prescribed for it um, sometimes include uh, prescribing things like vitamin D, uh, calcium supplements, a magnesium, um, in combination with weight-bearing exercise. So I said that 75%, like if you look around your classmates, right, that means that like in our class, right, at least 12 of us will be impacted by this. That's significant, right? I know. I'm really worried about Mrs. Phillips already. Um, so, um, what can we do now that prevents the problems associated with this later in life? I know that this is not maybe necessarily the way that we're all thinking, 
but I'm an old man now, so I think this way. Um, well, the number one thing that you can be doing is occasionally taking vitamin D. Vitamin D is really good for you. The number one, the number two that you, you can do is not, don't take a whole lot of ibuprofen. Ibuprofen is actually erodes away at calcium in your bones. Like you're nodding your head, probably the doctors have told you, don't stop taking ibuprofen, right? Take more vitamin D. The third thing is watch your weight. It's as simple as that. Um, because if, if, as we age, if we have a, additional weight on, our on the structure of the skeleton, that is going to cause additional pain. Not just related to osteoporosis, but lower back pain and all sorts of things, right? Additionally, it makes the heart work harder. Yes, Ms. Wilson. Is this genetic? It can be, right? Um, but for the most people, it's, 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 what we're talking about is something that is hormonal in nature. So it may, be, it may be caused by a drug, it may be caused by lifestyle. Well, my mom has it, that's why. Yeah, there's certain forms of it that are, yes. All right, osteomalacia, right? This is again, a lack of calcium in tissues and a failure of the bone tissue to calcify, right? So in osteoporosis, we're talking about depletions of calcium and you know, normal bones being depleted of calcium. In this, we're talking about the calcium's there, but it's not calcifying, right? The calcium is there, but it's not calcifying. So you look at these bones, they look very strange. All of the calcium is there, but none of the crystallization is there. None of that matrix of support is there. They are not calcifying, right? So you can have calcium that's not calcified, like drink a glass of milk and you're drinking just that, right? Calcium that's not calcified, it's not crystallized, if you will. Um, the yeah. That's a, I believe a femur, yeah. And you will see, if you work at Campbell's, you work at some facilities, uh, Le Bonner, you will see these types of x-rays. Um, occasionally they get shared on the group me um, by some of the students that have graduated. Um, this, pediatric. yeah, pediatric. So this is a developmental thing. It, it happens early on. Yeah, this is, this is definitely a pediatric disorder. Um, great questions. So we don't see it initially right after birth. We see it as the child begins to age, as they're running around, they're putting more stress on those bones, the bones can't handle the stress, so they start to bow like this, right? Um, so generally, this is related to a low amounts of phosphate in the blood. Um, and again, this may be tied to the inability to uptake vitamin D. So they may be getting enough vitamin D, they may be, take, they may be drinking enough milk, but their body's not, doesn't recognize the vitamin D is important, so they have a decreased amount of phosphate. Um, it's also associated with hepatic diseases, chronic pancreatitis, and a number of other problems within the GI system. Um, if it occurs before the growth plate closes. Like in this case here, it's referred to as rickets, right? You've probably heard about rickets, right? Um, so the bones are going to appear sponge-like and uh, it's going to s appear similar in terms of the bone evaluation to osteoporosis. Um, but we're going to get these, uh, these areas where the bones actually start to bow as well. We might also notice pseudo fractures or looser zones, um, areas where it appears to be fractured. Um, it's not actually fractured, it's just an abnormal kind of a mineralization that's occurring there. Uh, I think that's all that I'll say about it. Um, again, dietary supplements are gonna be the main form of treatment for this. So, Rickets in particular, we often see in populations where there's poor uh, nutrition, where the populations experienced a famine or the children did not receive sufficient um, food. Okay, Paget's disease. 
we don't know what causes this. It's a, mel it's a metabolic disorder. It may have a genetic link. It may be related to viral infectious agents. So it's still being researched, its etiology. Um, it is uh, generally going to begin in a person's 50s, so it affects an older population. Um, and I, I don't at this time like have data on its incidence. But basically, there's two stages of destruction that occur. The first stage is what we call an osteolytic stage. Um, so we start to, in this osteolytic stage, the, the bone is destroyed, I believe, from the inside out. Let me see. Yeah. The bone undergoes uh, continuous destruction on page 356, top of the page. And then this osteoblastic stage the bone is simultaneously replaced by abnormally soft and poorly mineralized material. So we see the bone destroyed and then replaced with something almost more like a, a cartilage or something. It's just poorly mineralized. Um, there is not a known cure with this. So what we may be called on to do is certain types of x-rays can reveal the presence of uh, a Paget's disease. So if we look on page 355, we see this lateral skull x-ray where we can see the bone appears more like an osteoporosis type bone. So there's demineralization, but then there's also, it looks like the bone's been filled in by this cotton wool type stuff. So that's that poor osteoblastic stage as well. So this is advanced Paget's disease, um, sometimes also called osteitis deformans. Um, complications associated with this are, are pain, right, and ultimately like failure of the skeletal system. Um, they're also at increased risk for development of osteogenic sarcoma. So because of the, the changes that are occurring with the bones, we can start to see possible mutations like cancer. Um, another example is found on page 355. It looks like a forearm and we see um, an advanced uh, case, of, oh actually it's, uh, it's the, the lower leg, uh, Paget's disease in the tibia. All right, so I'm shifting gears just a little bit. So what I was looking at primarily then was the way that the thyroid and the thyroid complex starts to affect things like bone growth, bone development, right? Skeletal anatomy, so skeletal pathology related to the endocrine system. Now we're going to look at the pituitary gland, and when the pituitary gland is acting strange, what do we expect to result? The first is acromegaly, um, and this is caused by a disturbance of the pituitary gland. Um, these are people who are giants, right? Um, and so what is occurring here uh, is changes in the skeletal anatomy and basically an enlarged skeletal anatomy caused by over secretion of the growth hormone. So the, the uh, pituitary gland is overactive, especially in early childhood and through adolescence and even into adulthood, and the individual skeletal system grows very, very rapidly. The problem with that um, is that the heart can't support all that growth. So there's a related heart problem where the heart simply, is, the heart hasn't grown, just the skeletal anatomy. And so the heart is having to work that much harder in order to support this large anatomy. Um, so this can be caused by a pituitary adenoma. Um, it can also just be caused by a dysregulation of the pituitary gland. Um, in terms of physical characteristics, these people have a distinct facial appearance, right? Also, sometimes the hand, like on page 356, is referred to as spade-like. The hand is much, much larger, and it has a different shape. So the, the thumb comes closer to the length of the other fingers, right? Um, so the thumb has grown into where it's more like, if you looked at a, at a deck of cards, like a spade on the deck of cards. Um, so the, almost all the fingers are the same. Uh, MRI is going to be the preferred way of looking at this. So since we're looking at the adrenal gland, MRI is going to be the best way to evaluate what's going on with the adrenal gland. And then treatments a lot of times are focused on 
um, either radio surgery or surgery to disable the function, the functionality of the pituitary gland. So we're going to actually going to damage, intentionally damage the pituitary gland as a means to stop this overgrowth. Okay. Another pituitary disorder that's important to us is diabetes insipidus. This is different from diabetes mellitus, right? Um, and this is often related to um, secondary or interference with the ADH uh, synthesis. So don't worry so much about, again, about the hormones, this antidiuretic hormone or whatever. Um, just know that what occurs as a result of this is polyuria and increased thirst. Um, so, so that means that the urine is going to have a low osmolality. They're basically just peeing out water, right? And they're peeing kind of constantly. Um, and their body is dysregulated in terms of all of the blood sugar and salts that are there in the in the thing. So as a result of that, anytime we've got something that's messing with the amount of stuff that's in the blood system, the kidneys are going to be what's going to be impacted. So we are concerned with kidney function in the presence of this. Um, oftentimes an MRI may be helpful in looking at the pituitary gland to make sure that there's not something else going on, but in general this is going to be diagnosed with uh, labs. Okay. The pituitary gland also can shrink or shrivel away. Um, this can be caused by an, a pituitary infarction. So if the pituitary gets hung up on itself or on bony anatomy, it can wrap up on itself and then it is not going to be able to secrete quite the same um, uh, amount of hormones. Um, it can also be caused by genetic disturbances, right? So uh, the uh, embryonic uh, mutations that cause uh, changes in the pituitary which lead to pituitary necrosis. Um, there's a number of other possible links or causes for it. Uh, <coughs> oftentimes diagnosis can be done with an MRI of the brain. It can be enhanced or non-enhanced in uh, CT. Uh, the signs that we're going to be associated with this, um, let me see real quick. It's just going to be all sorts of hormonal dysregulation, right? Um, so there's a broad spectrum of things that are going to be tied to this. And uh, treatment of this a lot of times is some kind of hormone replacement therapy. Since the hormones are dysregulated, we'll have to see what particular hormones were impacted by that and then supplement that with other hormones. Um, I've known someone who has hypopituitarism and it caused um, them to not grow very rapidly as a child. So there was concern. They, it wasn't that they had low birth weight. They were born um, at a healthy weight, but then they did not, they were not growing at the same rate as other people in their class, right? Um, and so eventually they had to go on a growth hormone um, and receive shots like every uh, week or so. And then eventually it was every day um, for that growth hormone. And now that individual is at puberty and they're doing just fine, right? So they figured out what exact um, hormones were being impacted by it, and they were able to receive hormone therapy. Okay, adrenal gland disorders. Um, and you'll notice, I don't necessarily have a picture of the adrenal glands on this MRI images, this MRI image here, but um, I do want to talk about the connection between the pituitary gland and the adrenal gland, which is what we're talking about when we talk about Cushing syndrome. Um, so, what we've got going on in Cushing syndrome is an excess of cortisol production by the adrenal cortex. So imagine now what this thing that's a cortical steroid that I mentioned was a neuro, neurotoxic um, is being overproduced by the adrenal, adrenal glands. Um, and so this uh, has a number of causes 
but the individuals with this disorder start to develop certain characteristics, physiological characteristics, that um, are linked to this disorder. Let me see if there's an image here. There's not an image in our textbook. Sometimes they're described as having round or moon type faces, um, excess fat in the trunk and neck of the body, um, and the skin is thin. It does not heal very well after injury. Um, oftentimes labs are gonna be important um, for, the, for a, re a review of this. Um, but one of the one of the important things is to rule out where is this disorder originating from? Is it happening within the adrenal, or is it linked rather to a pituitary adenoma? Right. So that's why I included this MRI image here. Um, we may, even though we're suspicious of the Cushing's disease, um, you know, originating with over secretion of corticosteroids with the pituitary, we need to go back upstream a little ways um, and, look, and look at the pituitary gland, make sure that that's not what's actually causing the adrenals to overproduce the cortical steroid. Um, additionally, MRI and CT of the adrenal glands may be helpful. Um, again, just trying to rule out, is this a pituitary disorder that's causing the adrenals to overfunction, or is this just focused on the adrenals? Um, Depending on what we've got going on, this may require, uh, again, stereotactic radiosurgery, actual brain surgery. Um, it may require surgical resection of the adrenals. Um, and uh, if it's not treated, this disease is not compatible with life, right? So ultimately can lead towards death. All right, adrenal carcinomas are super rare. Um, this is what they look like. They look awful um, if, once they've developed a, a certain amount of aggressiveness. And you'll notice, uh, if you're looking at the textbook, I've skipped over Addison disease. There's not really anything I, I, we need to say about that, so we can just ignore that one in the textbook. But adrenal carcinomas are helpful because this is what we're looking for when we do scan through the adrenals for CT, right? We're making sure this isn't going on because if this is going on, we would expect metastases to the lungs or metastases to other parts of the abdomen. Um, so this is very clear. I have a, sometimes have a difficult time picking out the adrenals on the CT axial images, right? They can be tricky to see. They're very small. Um, that I can definitely see, right? Um, so areas for metastases, lung, breast, kidneys, pancreas, GI, pretty much anywhere in the body as well as the lymphatics. Um, so when we're looking for contrast washout, so we do an abdomen exam, we find an incidentaloma, we find something's funny, the adrenal gland looks a little enlarged, right? Not this big, but a little enlarged. Um, the reason we do that washout is to make sure that that thing's just gonna stay a little bit enlarged versus becoming this thing, right? Um, and, and developing metastases. Okay, pancreatic disorders. So you, you notice I've jumped now to a totally different part of the, a different organ in the, uh, in the endocrine system. The primary thing that we're concerned with, with the pancreas in terms of hormonal function, so the pancreas does two things. It can help with the production of bile used for um, digestion. It can also produce hormones linked to the um, a number of things with the bloodstream, but in this case, blood sugar levels. So with diabetes mellitus, um, this is a syndrome that's associated with chronic hyperglycemia. So chronic high amounts of sugar in the bloodstream, um, as well as with uh, glucose intolerance and changes in the way the body metabolizes carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. Um, so. We can look at a normal blood glucose level, normal amount of blood sugar, right? And it should be fairly low. Like the textbook ranges it gives are 70 to 120 milligrams per deciliter in the blood. Um, if it gets higher than that, we start to worry that an individual has diabetes. So, and this is a fairly large amount of the population, about 10% of the population have uh, type one diabetes um, and then uh, another 
Oh, I'm sorry, 10% 10 10 is about the entire population, both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So diabetes mellitus, um, sometimes uh, type 1 diabetes, is developed in childhood. We can look for uh, some different markers associated with it. Um, the causes of it um, is that... <clears throat> Let me see. I don't really have. Oh, the pancreatic autoimmune destruction of pancreatic B cells. Um, I'm not going to ask you a, a quiz question about that. But what we need to know is these symptoms that are tied to it. Um, so fluctuations in blood glucose levels, right? Um, and these can be serious. So things related to it are things like increased urine output. Um, Difficulty in uh, sorry, difficulty in the kidney function, um, and ultimately it can relate. It can cause things like uh, almost a seizure-like activity or a difficulty in 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 thinking straight. Um, it can even cause a person to go into a coma if it's not regulated. So confusion, loss of consciousness, seizure, all those types of things. Mm -hmm. Um, if it gets really severe, it can be linked to death. Um, so that's type 1 diabetes. The treatments related to it are generally um, giving the person insulin, right? The insulin's going to allow the blood sugars to be broken down. So it's as simple as that in terms of treatment. Type 2 diabetes, in this, in this instance, we have a person who's insulin resistant. Um, and this is a much more common form of diabetes. A lot of it is related to age, um, as well as certain ethnicities, as well as environmental factors and individual health choices. Things like smoking, um, high blood pressure, um, eating a lot of fatty foods, things like that. Um, so we've identified a metabolic syndrome that's connected to this disorder um, and so we can start to talk about people being pre-diabetic right um, the complications again are, are are similar all of these life choices are again affecting pancreatic b cells um, and the associated complications are things like coronary artery artery disease um, vascular disease um, as well as kidney problems um, treatment for this is largely going to be related to the person's choice of what they're eating, right? Okay, the final thing that we're going to look at um, here is related to the thyroid stuff and all of these complex of connected systems when we talk about the thyroid and parathyroid. So hyperthyroidism, sometimes referred to as Graves' disease, um, in this, what we've got is a body that's secreting antibodies that attach to the thyroid and wear away at um, certain thyroid receptors so the thyroid grows larger, right? Um, so this is something we commonly ask patients about prior to giving them IV contrast because if they've got hyperthyroidism, we're talking about fatigue, goiter, hair loss, sweating, think changes in the skin and the eyes, but more importantly than that, we can trigger what's called a thyroid storm, right? So if the individual is exposed to IV contrast, we are putting them at risk for a chance of having this thyroid storm, which can be very serious, even life-threatening. Diagnosis for this is generally going to be lab, lab tests. We can also do these nuclear medicine things, which I can have no clue what I'm looking at here, but it, I believe it's increased activity within the, within the thyroid. Um, <clears throat> treatments a lot of times are gonna be, um, again, done by nuclear medicine. So injection with iodine-123, which then is, the iodine's taken up by the thyroid and it causes the, uh, the thyroid to um, decrease in size. Okay. Hypothyroidism, right? Um, this is caused by a deficiency of the thyroid hormone, right? So hyperthyroidism, it 
doesn't have receptors and this one it doesn't have the hormone um, there's a bunch of different ways reasons that might be caused and the symptoms that we're going to look to for this are um, things again like decreased energy uh, intolerance to cold um, personality changes dry skin um, it may develop into what we call a, a goiter lab tests are going to be the primary way that we will look at it if these things get even brighter right we've tipped the scale into what we're calling thyroid cancer right and the important thing here is that I'm not necessarily worried about the different types of cancer here but in terms of treatment is the exact same treatment right <coughs> so in my mind I'm not really sh worried or concerned with are we talking about hyperthyroidism or thyroid cancer because the diagnostic criteria is nuclear medicine and the treatment criteria is nuclear medicine right so just I guess give yourself a pass and just know that if you're talking about thyroid stuff you're talking about nuclear medicine well then why do you care at all well it goes back to that iodine thing right we're treating it we're diagnosing it and we're treating it with iodine right so what's the problem the problem is a critical thinking about scheduling right in terms of your workflow <coughs> if you got a patient who's scheduled for a CT scan or any kind of IV contrast study that needs to be done after whatever nuclear medicine's doing right nuclear medicine is trying to flush the thyroid with iodine they're trying to fill the thyroid with radioactive iodine so what's the problem if I have just done a CT contrast study on this patient I just filled the patient with iodine, non-radioactive iodine, which wasn't very helpful. So I could significantly delay the patient's treatment by doing the CT first or doing the IVP first, right? So this was a bigger deal back in the days of IVPs when we were doing a lot of IVPs in the general rad department. We need to schedule, as during scheduling, ask the patient, do you have any nuclear medicine studies scheduled in the next week or so? Do you have any nuclear medicine treatments scheduled in the next week or so, right? So we would commonly ask the patient that. Um, I think it's still a good rule of thumb if you're working in a CT department or if you're working regularly injecting people with iodine contrast to, make, to just make sure that you're asking them, do they have any nuclear medicines tests or treatments scheduled? So you make sure that you're not injecting contrast prior to this because it can lead to problems. Okay, hyperparathyroidism. Again, this is something that can affect the skeletal system. I'm not necessarily worried about um, any of the you memorizing three different types or diagnosis or even the treatment on this. I just want you to know what it is, right? Hyperparathyroidism and recognize that it's something different from hyperthyroidism, right? So hyperthyroidism, I've said, is a lot like thyroid cancer. I'm not making a distinction. Both are uh, examined by nuclear medicine. Both are treated by nuclear medicine. Hyperparathyroidism is something totally different. Just don't get tripped up by it. And most likelihood, if you see this on an exam, it's a distractor, right? The last thing I'll say is hypothyroidism is a totally different thing, right? Very, very different. And it's uh, even though some of the symptoms are similar, its treatments are different. Don't worry too much about any of this stuff. Um, it can lead to increased urine, calcium, and renal stones. So the last thing that I'll talk about um, where this does affect uh, renal function is that if we've got a hyperparathyroidism, we can be worried about nef nephrocalcinosis, right? Um, so this is calcium phosphates kind of sprinkled throughout the renal parenchyma. It looks like they've got kidney stones all through the parenchyma, right? Um, so not only can hyperparathyroidism lead to kidney stones, it can also lead to this nephrocalcinosis. And this is really just a term you should understand um, as something distinct from a kidney stone. Uh, all right, and that is it for our lecture. Thank you all so much.